So, great podcast today with uh, Bellagi. Awesome guy. We talked about aerospace. We talked about disruptive innovation and the future of air transport, which I knew absolutely nothing about. And we talked about urban air mobility. And if you know what that is, you're one step up on me. Um, Anyway, hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Awesome. And we're live. Bilaji, thank you very much for joining me on my podcast. Um, So we're at the NED. We're doing it downstairs in the lower ground. So a little background noise, a couple of drinks are coming. Um, So apologies if there's any any background noise. Um, But yeah, um, tell us a bit about yourself. You're great to uh, catch up with you, Lewis. So so I'm Bilaji. I'm a strategy manager. I work for what is called the Aerospace Technology Institute in the UK. And uh, what we do is fundamentally, uh, we are a public-private partnership. We work in collaboration with the aerospace industry in the UK and the UK government to support uh, research and development and future technologies for the aerospace sector. And to make sure that we realize the economic impact uh, that the aerospace industry has to offer and that the UK retains its global leadership position in this this industry. Funded by? Uh, We are part funded by the industry and we are part funded by the government as well. So... It's, it's, as I said, a, a public-private partnership uh, that works really well. Nice. How did you get into that? So, well, I've always been interested in aerospace um, right from the beginning. Um, from the from start, when I was young, um, I always wanted to be a pilot and actually realized it's quite expensive um, as an affair to become a, become a pilot. So can I you, ended can up... You fly, can you fly? Uh, I can fly, but I'm not sure anyone would trust me with their aircraft. <laughs> right. So... Um, so I started off, um, you know, um, I did my high school and then I ended up becoming an engineer. Um, started my career in the sharp end, uh, working for an airline in the heavy engineering sector um, and doing, you know, strip downs of large aircraft like Boeing 747s cool. and um, had hands on experience doing that. I also worked at the front end of, of the design process of aircraft. So I worked for a company that did engineering design services for um, aerospace, uh, nice. OEMs and majors. So worked on a series of aircraft like 320s, 330s, the kind of aircraft that we fly every day. Yeah. Um, did a lot of modification projects on the engineering front on those airplanes. Then I decided to do my um, MBA in aviation management. Um, so I went off In the UK? To, uh, I did that in Melbourne, Australia, so wow. in the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Um, and once I did my MBA, I ended up being a consultant uh, working for Foster & Sullivan, which is quite nice. exciting. And how was um, studying in Melbourne? Oh, it was fantastic. Actually, Melbourne's one of my favorite cities, and um, it's very multicultural, very diverse, one of the best yeah. cities to live in. Uh, it's been really? consistently rated as one of the best, best cities in the world to live in. Mm. Um, and it was fantastic being a student in Melbourne, so yeah. I got exposed to a whole range of activities within the university. The university environment itself was quite fantastic, although an MB- MBA is not really an easy affair. Um, no. I got involved in a lot of activities which got me really in- interested and engaged in that yeah. program. And um, as soon as I finished that, uh, I had an opportunity to, to join um, a consultancy in um, as an analyst to, to look at the aerospace market. Okay, um, back in the UK? Uh, that was, actually, I got interviewed in Melbourne. Uh, right. I had the opportunity to go to India uh, for that business, although I was working for the European team. Okay. And uh, managed to set up a team in India and work with that team in India. And then uh, a year later, I actually moved to the UK to run Brilliant. that business. So it's pretty much working with a global client base of aerospace companies. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, what's going on in, the, in, in aviation at the moment? So, the um, state of the market? Yep, well, aerospace is a, and aviation more broadly is a very, very interesting sector. Um, uh, the sector uh, has a global economic impact of over $2.7 trillion. Wow, uh, $2.7 trillion. It, Yes, and it contributes to over 3.5% of the global GDP year on year. So it's a quite significant sector. And uh, if I have to throw some statistics at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the sector supports almost half a million jobs um, globally. Um, or actually 60, 62 million jobs globally. Just the airports alone support over half a million jobs. Wow. Um, and um, how's, that, how's that changed? So it's, it's on the rise. So the, the sector rise. as a whole is, is growing, actually. Um, and if you look at the overall growth rates, um, the industry has grown at an average of about 5% year on year consistently, despite the economic shocks of 9-11 or 
the um, uh, post-economic crisis uh, of 2008, the sector still consistently grown despite those shocks, right. um, which is partly fueled due, due to the growing economic conditions in the Far East and APAC, uh, but also because of the, the established market conditions in the UK and in the West. Because you see um, a little bit of um, in the news of some, some airlines going under, struggling. Yep. Generally, generally yep. it's... It's still yeah, good. Well, airline business is really competitive, as uh, yeah. somebody really um, uh, popularly said. You know, if you want to become a millionaire, you know, start with a billion and start an airline, right? So, <laughs> so it is a really competitive business. Um, it's really hard to compete. It's cutthroat competition in the airline business. So, you're carrying a whole volume of people, and there are fuel price fluctuations in the market that affect an airline's operating cost quite significantly. And the cost of owning and operating aircraft doesn't come cheap either. So yeah. it's a really expensive business to be in. Um, but the ones who got it right have always stayed and made it um, a quite a glamorous industry that it is today. Yeah. Um, to just give you some perspective on, on how many people actually take to the skies each day, almost on a daily basis, there are about 10 million people who fly, oh. and there are over 100,000 flights each day globally, and there is about 17 to 18 billion dollars worth of goods being transported by air as well on a daily basis. So, as, a, as an industry, it's got a huge impact. Yeah. And yeah. if I have to give you some more stats on how many aircraft that are out there, large commercial air transport aircraft, there are over 26,000 aircraft flying today. Wow. And that fleet is expected to double over the next 20 years. And if you think about that, um, the current context of airport congestion and, and everything else, it is quite a, an, an exciting industry to be in, in terms of how we're going to accommodate that growth. For and the example. poor planet is going to really pay for that, right? Is um, there any, anything innovative around fuel and... I mean, there is a lot going on in this industry in, in terms of, I mean, if we think about aerospace in comparison to automotive, um, I mean, we've seen that a revolution already happening in air, uh, automotive um, yeah. as vehicles start, as we have more vehicles on the road, we are thinking about more greener, more um, environmentally friendly cars. And the same trends actually following suit in aerospace. In fact, it's been going on for a lot of, lot of years now. Right. And there are two factors driving that. Um, one is we need to make, um, make it environmentally feasible to be able to double the number of aircraft and to be able to meet that passenger demand from growing economies and also existing economies. Um, if you're going to double the fleet, that's obviously going to double the emissions, and we don't yes. want that to happen. So we really need to be uh, innovative from a technology perspective and also from an operational perspective on how efficient can we get. Yeah. So technology plays a huge role in this. So how do we invent the next generation of technologies that will allow us to cut emissions, become more efficient? and how we fly. It also comes down to how airlines operate. You know, there are efficiencies to be had on the ground, in the air, um, et cetera, et cetera. So are you flying the right profile um, so you actually maximize your fuel efficiency? Are you flying the right routes? Are you flying the right type of aircraft? Are your f is your fleet new in comparison to yeah. um, the type of aircraft you operate? So you could be flying really old aircraft, which might be fuel guzzlers, compared to new airlines today, which are much more efficient when it comes to newer aircraft, utilizing newer aircraft types. Yeah. So there is a lot that is happening, um, both from an operational perspective and from a technology perspective. Um, but fr from where I work, yeah. I get to do a lot in the technology space. And right. uh, we get to sink our teeth in all the new and exciting technologies that are happening and are being developed in the space including new engine programs, new wings, utilization of new materials to build aircraft, which will actually substantially reduce the weight of uh, newer aircraft, making them more efficient, uh, smart and connected, etc. Brilliant. And so you're getting involved from the perspective of funding them, yeah. evaluating which ones to fund? Absolutely. So my role within the ATI itself um, is, is twofold. So I also, I, I lead on the ATI's um, strategic work, so in terms of actually working out where the organization, uh, ATI as an organization needs to go, how we um, establish and work with our um, industry partners to deliver what we have to deliver as strategic objectives for both the UK and for the industry. Um, and also I work um, on assessing all the proposals that come to us on, their, on the validity of their business case. So 
what we don't want to do is fund technology for technology's sake. Yeah, and yeah. all the technology that we fund needs to find, uh, earn its way into the market. Yeah. Um, and it won't do that unless, unless it's actually delivering the benefits it's supposed to deliver, both from an economic perspective, also from an environmental perspective. Right, okay. um, and it needs to be the right technologies um, that will actually benefit the UK in the long run. Um, so my job becomes really interesting in the fact that I get to work with companies who are at the cutting edge of technology development in this sector. Great. And are they typically, are they startups? Are they typically small businesses that are trying to... I mean, the aerospace industry is quite unique in its, uh, in its um, setup that there are very large companies um, which operate in the sector. And the nature of the industry is that it's quite expensive, right? So um, most of the technologies on aircraft that we fly today or already operate or, or designed and developed and are already operating at the edge of physics or right. limits of physics, yeah. right? So to deliver efficiencies further from there is really difficult. And it requires often, if you look at a large aer aerospace or aircraft development programs, they end up being multinational programs. So with right. multiple governments supporting it because the amount of cost involved in, in developing new technologies. The fundamental issues being um, the need for safety and certification. Yeah. Um, the nature of the industry is that you know safety is paramount. Um, safety beats price, uh, efficiency, and everything else. So you, we really need to be sure that these technologies are deployable on an aircraft. Unlike an automotive, where you even on, in the automotive industry, we've seen the recent incidents where you know new technology introduction has led to accidents and yeah, yeah. fatalities and people getting injured because of that. And I don't want to name specific companies who've been doing these tests. Um, we can't afford to do those things in aerospace. Um, yeah. it'll, it'll be detrimental to the whole industry and the economy that it supports. Um, so it's really important to make sure that regulations are adhered to and the certification regime that the industry has set itself up to is, is followed, which also makes it a real big barrier for really small companies to, to operate at a whole okay. aircraft level. Yeah. However, there is a lot of scope for small companies, and there is a huge supply chain, um, global supply chain that supports and delivers the large companies who are doing the whole aircraft um, or engines or systems. Yeah. And these are not necessarily large companies, right? So they, these range from small companies to mid-caps who are operating yeah. in this sector and with different levels of capabilities to, from design to actually manufacturing yeah. and, and servicing these products. However, coming back to startups, I, I think there is a significant scope for, for startups in this sector. And more recently, this is one of the pieces of work that I've been leading at the ATI, um, is to understand how we can better support startups. I think there is a need for startups because yeah. the industry is quite used to working in a certain way. And if, if I can be bold enough to say that, it's not necessarily the fastest and most agile way of, of dealing with the technology challenges of the future. And with the scope, for innovation and the need for innovation in the sector, I think there is a tremendous opportunity for startups to come and change the way things work today. Yeah. And this will this can range from areas such as autonomy to connectivity to newer materials to actually startups who are actually operating in the tech industry. You know, and there are a lot of startups in the automotive sector, for example, yeah, who can find their way into aerospace. And there are. There are significant um, new areas that the aerospace industry ex is exploring. We've seen the electrification of cars and automotives, for example, and the same trends following suit in aerospace. There is a. Well, did you see at some point there'll be uh, electric uh, airplanes? Uh, uh, absolutely, and really? um, and the whole industry is actually positioning itself to, to move towards that. Great. And electrification in aerospace, for me, is not something new, but I okay. think there is a kind of revival of a lot of activity in that space right, today. Right. Um, if, we, if we look at what the industry needs to achieve in terms of environmental targets in the next 20, 30 years, yeah. um, incremental innovation is not going to really deliver that change. Um, so the industry kind of understands that. There is a huge uh, focus on actually achieving a significant uh, step change performance from both technologies and operational improvements to actually deliver that efficiency. And this is where I think there is a huge scope for startups to actually come in and introduce new technologies, new business models, and new processes. Uh, and and are these startups industry. originating from um, some of the universities? I mean, there or? is a huge university um, opportunity in the UK uh, and elsewhere as well. So yeah. a lot of startups obviously are, are originating from universities. Um, in the UK, obviously, there are a lot of startups who are actually doing work from within and okay. spin-offs spin from universities. 
Um, I think there is a huge uh, base of startups that, that the industry can tap into yeah. um, to actually deliver the technologies that are required for tomorrow, uh, for the future. And um, uh, when it comes to startups, there are some specific challenges as to how we actually encourage startups to work in aerospace. And that's actually the, the piece of work that I alluded to in terms of um, uh, what I've been looking at at the ATI right. for the past six months. And um, this goes back to how we fundamentally engage, how the industry fundamentally engages with startups. As I said, it's a very traditional industry. It's got its own rules yeah. and ways of working um, and, and product development and technology development. But the industry, I think, is, is waking up to the fact that uh, there is actually a lot of benefit in working with startups and that everything that needs to be um, invented doesn't have to be invented by the large companies. Yes, yeah. um, because startups do start from a different base and they are much more agile and have a very much a problem-solving oriented way of working, uh, which I would say the industry uh, or the incumbents in the industry are not, not necessarily set up to do. Uh, in a way, they are actually victims of their own scale of yeah, operations, yeah. Um, which also because of their stakeholders who measure them by their rate of returns and short-term uh, returns, yeah. doesn't allow large companies to operate that way. True. I'm excited about traveling to the moon soon. SpaceX and... Um, so, uh, so that's an example, right? So what SpaceX is, is doing to the um, space sector could be, we could see similar trends in the in the aerospace sector, right? With startups actually coming in and changing the way the industry works. They, they were well, I mean, but they need to be well funded though, right? Absolutely. So funding is one of the fundamental challenges. So I was going to come to that. So yeah. um, one is actually identifying ways in which startups can work with aerospace companies, established aerospace companies, both in the UK and elsewhere. And if we look at um, companies outside of the UK, take Boeing for, as an example, they've identified this trend and they've started, a, started up a corporate bench capital arm called Boeing Horizon X, right. which actually proactively goes out there and looks, at, looks for startups that they can actually um, work with, technologies that they can actually leverage um, and apply back into their business of actually building airplanes. Great. Um, similar ventures have been started by other companies. So Airbus have Airbus ventures in France and in Silicon Valley. Right. Um, there is scope for such ventures in the UK. Uh, there is scope for cash uh, to be applied to this sector. Again, aerospace is not necessarily the most attractive sector for venture capitalists or um, yeah. private equity investors. The reason being the high barriers to entry, the long time to market, and the amount of time it actually takes to, to recover um, from your investments um, or the benefit of your investments. However, that's changing. As I said, you know, the development cycles are shortening. Uh, with startups coming into the picture, there is a huge scope for a for, um, um, lot of investments to materialize um, sooner than they normally would in this sector. Yeah, yeah. So um, both from a funding perspective, but there is also an opportunity for somebody like the ATI to actually provide that platform to connect startups with, with existing companies in the, in the aerospace sector, both in the UK and elsewhere, to actually realize um, breakthrough technologies of the future, right? So yeah. to give you an example, so I was just talking about autonomy, electrification. These are areas where there are a lot of startups working in other sectors like automotive, or you take uh, any other transportation sector, even companies working in the tech industry, so the software yeah. industry. Um, if we look at airport operations, for example, there is a huge scope for applying software um, and leveraging digital and data-enabled capabilities to change how passengers travel in the future. And if we can actually squeeze more efficiencies out of airport operations or how an airline operates, it equates to dollar value for both the airlines and airport operators, for example, and which means we're going to free up capacity, which means we're going to encourage um, or encourage the growth of the sector, which means yeah. the aircraft manufacturers end up selling more airplanes. And um, when there is a demand, it needs to be met, and we can't have current infrastructure constraints or operational constraints really uh, constrain the growth of the sector. So there is huge opportunities for us to leverage what's being developed in other sectors, and especially by startups, and yeah. find a way to apply that in aerospace and aviation more broadly. Brilliant. And do you get involved? We talked a bit about it <clears throat> before we started recording. Um, urban, urban air mobility. Yeah. So is this is this the area of flying taxis and? Well, it's very exciting, right? Super so cool, yeah. Yeah, what's, absolutely. Uh, what's going so on 
Yeah, we've seen um, we've seen um, car sharing and carpooling yeah. and shared mobility as a concept really, you know, really being talked about in automotive today. But I think that's going to be the future for aerospace as well. So. Uh, some people would say, you know, if you want to know where aerospace going, is going in the next 10 years, see where automotive was about 10 years ago. Um, so I think there is a huge opportunity for business model transformation. But the thing, but the thing with cars, though, <coughs> yeah. is most people have one car, yep. maybe two. Yep. Um, obviously, aeroplanes you share already, right? Absolutely. Um, so how do you see it mirroring? Okay, so let's take the automotive industry as an example. So you talked about car ownership, but when we talk about ownership trends, you can see that's changing as well. So uh, talking about future generations and younger generation of people, um, it's becoming less and less attractive for people to own cars. So absolutely. that's yeah. uh, absolutely what's actually driven the growth of the likes of Uber or you know, the other uh, ride-sharing companies world over. Uh, ten years ago, you wouldn't have thought about Uber, right? So Uber's not even ten years old, and it's already its market cap's already bigger than that of a BMW, which is hundreds of years old. Um, so if you take the examples of, of companies like Uber in the automotive space, they don't really own cars or make cars. Yeah. They are actually offering a service, which yeah. is ultimately what you want. And what you and I want is ne not necessarily have a car, which I would probably drive uh, in, in the weekends. We all work in central London, especially yeah. urban residents like us. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to appreciate having a, having a car that we can't really use most of the time. And I think that's recognized world over, right? So with more than 70% of the population going to live in cities in the future, um, how people are shifting towards more ride sharing and shared mobility models. Absolutely. And even when it comes to owning cars, you know, people have moved towards leasing them rather than buying them. Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, how many people really own cars anymore? And that Completely gives you the agree. flexibility to yeah. upgrade. It gives you the flexibility to use what you want to use when you want to use it yeah. and actually derive more value of, out of an asset, which is actually a depreciating asset. Yeah. So if you think about the same from an air travel perspective or, or more broadly a transportation perspective, there is a huge opportunity for integrated mobility, right? So I really don't want to worry about uh, I need to book a taxi to go to Heathrow, I need to book my airline ticket separately, and then I'm going to have to find out how I go uh, from where I land to where I need to get to at the other end. So the future is actually integrated mobility solutions, right? So where I get, I, I really have to think about just one system which allows me to go from my sofa at this end to the <laughs> sofa on the other end, right? So I really yeah. don't want to worry about uh, all the different modes of transport that I need to book individually. If you think about air travel in that context, yeah. um, it's changing as well. So it's it's ripe for disruption. Do you think that you'll be able to get from your couch to a friend's couch in Melbourne? Absolutely. You hail a flying taxi. Absolutely. Take you to the, uh... the... That's the ultimate dream, right? So if you think about mobility, for me it's often quite easy to, to go fly from Heathrow to somewhere and come back than actually it is to get back from Heathrow to where I live, which is pretty much in London. Yeah. So if you think about the challenge, the challenge really is the last mile challenge, right? Yeah. So uh, it's the same issue. If, whereas on the other hand, if you were to fly um, with an airline and you landed at Heathrow and from Heathrow you had an urban air taxi waiting to pick you up and drop you at your place in about 15 minutes, and it's not even a challenge for Londoners, right? If I, were, I, if I were somebody living in Northampton and I flew into Heathrow, it's going to take me another three hours to get to where I live. Yeah. Right? I really don't want to. I, I really won't enjoy that commute and True. probably multiple modes of transport, right? It's not going to be a single journey. And if I'm a public transport user, I'm going to have to find a way to go from Heathrow to somewhere else from where again I catch a train, go to Northampton, then take a taxi from Northampton to where, I'm, where I actually live. So if you think about the cost of that journey, it becomes much more expensive than your air travel proposition. But are our cities built for this thing? I think there is a lot that we can do with technology, um, especially with automation and autonomy. Um, it's, it's going to a level, we, we've seen that in automotive, it's, it's because a lot of the cars today are at least partially autonomous, different levels of autonomy where it's driver assist. Um, next generation of cars are likely to become more autonomous. Do you see them flying around our tall buildings in the city? Absolutely. I think around? the technology kind of already exists, yeah. but not to the level of maturity that we need to be confidently able to apply in an urban environment. Yeah. Um, but I think the initial 
uh, application of um, flying vehicles will be in very dedicated airspace, which might not be in urban environments, but more um, point to point, uh, city to city, but beyond urban air environments. But eventually the technology will mature that regulators will have the confidence to actually apply to urban airspace. That's, that's the hope and that's the belief with which the industry is investing in it. Um, I think there is a lot of exciting stuff going on in this space. Um, in fact, from an ATI perspective, we've led an AME, uh, a proposal into government now called the Amy Johnson Challenge, uh, which is all about a developing a forward-thinking aviation system in the UK, which will allow the existing companies, the airports, or operators, and everybody else to come together and create a system within which we can develop such, and actually test and develop these kind of technologies for the future. And who are the key players in this? I mean, there are a lot of startups. Um, yeah. So you'd have seen a lot of startups in other parts of the world, like Lilium, for example. There is Olocopter and Ehang from China. Um, and even Airbus testing their own um, flying taxi Uber platform. And yeah, and Uber is definitely and working whatever. on their own platform called Elevate. You know, they're working yeah, with Embraer yeah. to build the um, um, vehicles themselves, and they're working with a range of other companies to develop technologies that will feed into it. Um, there are also a lot of UK companies who are looking at venturing into this. Aston Martin was one of them. Um, they were at the Farnborough Air Show recently and they oh, nice. actually uh, unveiled their concept flying taxi at the air show, which actually uh, got a lot of traction and um, interest from a whole range of uh, people from across the society. How far, <coughs> how high do these things fly? <coughs> so, um, sorry about that. So. Um, in terms of height, um, it's yet to be determined depending on which kind of routes they are applied to, right? So if you're flying in an urban environment, you're going to be um, much flying much lower than yeah, in yeah. class A airspace. Because if you're in class A airspace, you've got to think about how high you fly. So uh, it's not yet determined as to what the safe flying height for these things will be. It really depends on the environment in which they operate. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to uh, <coughs> hopping in a flying taxi. Oh, absolutely. Me too. Taking me to SpaceX, going to the moon. Coming back to town. Home. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Good. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining me on the podcast. Oh, thank you. Really yes. interesting oversight into aerospace industry and what's going on. Absolutely. And uh, let's reconnect in an, uh, soon yep. um, so we can take another check of, of what's been going on. Absolutely. Yeah, very exciting times. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. See ya. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places.